Hello, everyone. We're letting people come in. We always are delighted to see where you're coming from in the chat. This is terrific. We see a number of familiar names, which is great. Uh, I'm Letitia LaFollette, the president of the AIA, and it's my pleasure um, to welcome Kate Liska back to Archaeology Abridged. She gave us a wonderful talk last month on the discovery of amethyst by the Egyptians and how the pharaohs guarded and used that rare purple bling. If you missed it, please go to the AIA's website or simply search uh, for Archaeology Abridged on your computer and you'll find it as well as recordings of other wonderful short lectures in this new series that the AIA launched during the pandemic. So let me briefly introduce our speaker and then we can move on to hear her wonderful talk today. Dr. Kate Liska is the Benson and Pamela Herrer Fellow in Egyptology and Associate Professor of History at California State University, San Bernardino. She earned her doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania, and from 2012 to 2015, she was a Coatsen Postdoctoral Fellow and Lecturer at Princeton University. Her areas of specialization include Nubians in Egypt, ethnicity and identity in antiquity, multicultural interactions in frontier regions, and large-scale mining expeditions in antiquity. Dr. Liska is, is director of the Wadi El Houdi expedition in the Egyptian Eastern Desert. She'll be talking to us today about forts, prisons, or storage vaults, the three so-called fortresses of Pharaoh at Wadi El Houdi. Kate, to you. Uh, let's, let me share my screen really fast. Um, one second. Ah, I think I got it, is that right? Okay, cool. Um, hello everyone, thank you uh, once again to the AIA and thank you so much for having me back for a second talk about Wadi El Houdi. Uh, it is a real honor to be able to share a lot of this work with you all. Um, now, as some of you may know, I direct an archeological project in Egypt at a place called Wadi El Houdi. Uh, this is actually a very large area in the eastern desert southeast of the city of Aswan. Um, it's a mineral rich region where ancient Egyptians of the Middle Kingdom, you know, some 4,000 years ago and later, mined uh, amethyst among other raw materials. So last time we talked about how amethyst was used in beautiful jewelry for people like Egyptian princesses and how it's incredibly rare, how it's valuable and how basically its mining was essentially monopolized by the king. We also talked about the logistics of mining in a very harsh uh, Eastern desert, including how up to 1500 people somehow participated in this process and were supplied with food and water. Water is of course the most precious commodity in the desert and might have been brought for several kilometers, if not even the whole way from the Nile for the workers. Um, and so last time we talked about the actual mining process and about how the administrators at Wadi El Houdi wanted to intensely control and protect these mining operations. So if you missed it, uh, or if you're interested in seeing it again, the AIA did put it on YouTube, uh, so check it out. Um, but just know that you don't have to have seen the previous talk to follow along today. So I hope you enjoy today's talk too. Okay. Now, next to each of these very large amethyst mines, there are also very large buildings to help support the work in the desert. Um, and at Wadi El Houdi, we have three of these. So sites four, sites five, and sites nine. These are primarily the places I'm talking about today. Each of these places have their own personalities almost, and they basically offer complementary pieces of information that help us learn about the past. So I just wanna give you a very brief tour because I'm gonna be jumping back and forth between these places a lot. Okay, so site five was built first um, and it was built during the reign of Montuhotep IV. So that is basically like 1995 BCE that is. Um, and it was built onto a hill using the hill's natural topography and their boulders. So it ends up being this maze of walls and rooms with so many boulders where a boulder can both be a wall of one room, a floor of another room and an inscription space all at the same time. Um, and because it takes the shape of a hill, it really doesn't look like a lot of other uh, settlements in Egypt. So 
this is site nine, and I'm just going to digress for a minute uh, and do a bit of showing off. Our co-director, Brian Kramer, has been building these extraordinarily technologically advanced 3D models of uh, Wadi El Hudi. Um, site nine is our proof of concept, so you're getting a sneak peek at it right now um, because it's finally able to be able to share with people at this point. Um, and Frankly, I don't know of any other archaeological mission that's actually like creating 3D models of, of real large spaces at this point. So we are kind of at the forefront of tech. Anyway, totally digress. Um, but Site 9 was the second place that was built. Um, and it is built in the middle of a flat wadi. So that's a valley area. And they designed this space basically in the way that they wanted to use it because it wasn't confined to the hill right um so they built it by having the workers stack stones on one of another one another site nine was actually built during the reign of Sinwazrit the first so that's only like two kings after site five was built not very long after however Sinwazrit the first is somebody from a new dynasty and he's the very first king to annex parts of Nubia uh, as a territory controlled by the Egyptians. And there he built several mud, mud brick fortresses throughout lower Nubia. Um, and it basically represents a large political shift in, in the international world at that point. Um, and Site 9's design is actually similar to contemporary fortresses in lower Nubia that we're going to be talking about. Okay, so Site 4 was built third. We're not sure exactly when it was built, probably about 100 years after Site 9. Um, but it was the one that was used the latest as well. It was the last one that was used into the Middle Kingdom with its habitations going to the reign of Sobek Hotep IV uh, into the 13th dynasty, so something like uh, 1750 BCE. Now, Site 4 was also totally deconstructed and remodeled later by the Ptolemaic and Roman miners. So we have a couple of visible lines of Middle Kingdom walls that you can see in the red circles, um, but we can't actually reconstruct the whole blueprint at that point. That being said, Site 4 still has a lot of information about the Middle Kingdom and administration. Um, so we can see how the workers use the hillsides around them, and we also have a lot of archaeological evidence from this area too. Um, and we see how they use the larger landscapes in particular. And it's also very likely that once these various places were constructed, all of these spaces might have been used in tandem. They're not very far apart from one another. Um, so you can kind of envision them as a, as a group. Um, and we know this because um, there are several paths that lead between them. And there are also even lookout sites and watch posts that can see multiple sites in various directions. Um, so. Today, I want to focus on two main interconnected questions that you guys are going to help me with. The first one is, what were the buildings actually used for? And who were the laborers that used these buildings? Now, just to put you into the larger academic conversation, this all stems from previous scholars suggesting that these buildings were fortresses and that the laborers might have been slaves. Um, so today we are going to try to address these assumptions within the broader questions uh, and directly use both text and archaeology to try to answer them. Okay, so first um, let's look at, at some buildings and ask um, why these people might have actually assumed that the spaces at Wadi El Hudi were fortresses. Um, and one of the questions you have to ask is, well, what is the purpose of a fortress? Um, among other things, I would personally argue that a fortress is a building designed to protect against attackers, uh, typically a large scale group and possibly even an army. And the Egyptians had lots and lots of fortresses, especially in Lower Nubia, you just saw one at Urinardi, um, but also in the Sinai and in the Western Desert. Um, and these were these places were basically designed to protect against a significant number of invaders or, or significant invasion effort if it were to have happened. And the Egyptians had words for these spaces. They called fortresses either Menenu or Hetum. Um, 
and that's pretty standard for the lower Nubian fortresses. Now, interestingly, in our 280 some inscriptions from Wadi al Hudi, we don't have one use of either of these words. They, are, they don't use the word Menenu and they don't use the word Hetem. Um, but these, these words are applied to contemporary fortresses in Lower Nubia. But there's a third word, and it's a bit of a mystery word, and this word is Heneret. Um, its definition changes over time, and it can refer to so many different things, making the interpretation problematic. So this schema is a bit uh, simplified, but just go with me for a minute. Um, in the early Middle Kingdom, like the time that Site 5 and Site 9 were built, the word Heneret seems to refer to some sort of small temporary enclosure that people can take refuge in from an attack or possibly even attack from. Um, but this is not a formal full-scale fortress. Uh, then in parts of the Middle Kingdom, it can also refer to where cloth is made. Um, and we definitely know that that's not happening at Wadi al Hudi. Well, we don't have any cloth workshops. But then in the later Middle Kingdom, Heneret also seems to refer to a labor camp in which conscripted people or prisoners worked from unhappily. So there's a bunch of like records of Henereti prisoners like running away from fortresses and trying to get away. But those are later in the Middle Kingdom. So when you choose to define this word, if you don't want to assign a purpose to its translation, it's often translated as compound or enclosure because those types of words don't come with, you know, added levels of meaning to them. Now in the 280 inscriptions from Wadi al Hudi, we, we do have one. And so far only one example of the term Kenneret referring to Wadi al Hudi itself. Um, and so in inscription 51 uh, is actually written on site five. So this is one of the earlier places that's the hilltop settlement. Uh, and based on the paleography, and its location, it probably dates to the very early Middle Kingdom, possibly even one of the first written during the reign of Montuhotep IV, um, possibly slightly thereafter. Uh, and so this is the time when we have these defensible, sometimes temporary enclosure. And here, a guy by the name of Hepu says that he is the overseer of the Henret. So that probably means that he's the guy in charge and possibly even the guy in charge of the space that he's written on. So he's the guy in charge of site five. So essentially site five in this inscription might actually be a Henneret. Plus, if you look at the very last symbol of the word in the lower right corner over here, you can see this box type shape. Um, that actually might be some sort of depiction of you know, a box as the enclosure itself. So again, possibly even referring to site five as like this enclosed type of structure. So it does seem that site five was referred to as a Henret once uh, at the very early Middle Kingdom. Um, but the problem is, is when you look at all the scholarship on Wadi al Hudi, eh, nobody talks about site five as being a possible fortress. They all talk about site nine. Um, and that goes from Labib Nassim's first writing in 1925 to Ian Shaw's very cool 2019 book on ancient Egyptian warfare. Most people assume that site nine is a fortress. So I really want to look at the evidence of that with you guys today. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any textual reference to what site nine is called. Um, besides what its name actually might be for the building. So in the Stele of Horus, that's inscription 143, we have this very weird term where um, the official Horus uh, says that he's basically been commanded by the king to go and build a structure called Beautiful Is He in the Desert. Um, and so that might actually be the name of the area of Site 9. Uh, so we need to, we need to actually still corroborate this with archaeological evidence, um, but it is a possibility that we are looking into. But regardless, as you go on to continue to read this inscription, the inscription says nothing else about defense or attacks or fortifications. It basically directly associates this structure with the need for extracting amethyst in many ways. So those two meanings seem to be con uh, connected in this particular inscription. So. Instead, most of the evidence is based on an architectural comparison 
between Site 9 and the contemporary fortresses of Lower Nubia. And we know that the places in Lower Nubia are definitely forts. Um, and these, there are two levels of elements that make these connections. There are the architectural elements related to the administration, and there's also the architectural elements related to defense. So let's look at the administration first. So first, Site 9 is about as many meters squared as smaller fortresses in Lower Nubia, like Kuma. So spatially, it's, it's an acceptable size in many ways. Second, some fortresses in Lower Nubia, like Site 9, actually actively helped with mining procurement operations. So for example, at the fortresses of Askut and Forest East, both have examples of gold washing tables in or around them. So we know that miners in the desert would bring perspective ore back to the fortresses and basically help sift them out into these gold uh, and try to find gold pieces at that point. So site nine is doing something similar with amethyst extraction. Third, many fortresses in lower Nubia have these large well-built you know, command buildings in the corner that the administrators definitely controlled. So area A at site nine, which you see in the circle, it definitely fits that model. Um, this was a segregated space that the officials controlled um, with storage areas and they, they likely limited who could get in there. They limited access to it um, basically there and everywhere else. Plus, Many of these forts in Lower Nubia, as well as Area A in Site 9, have a path that specifically separates the exterior wall from the interior wall. And this basically stops people from being able to like hop right over the wall and then into the structure. So it's an extra level of protection that restricts access and people being able to get into spaces easily. And lastly, the fortresses of Lower Nubia all have granary storage areas with places where scribes could count grain um, and enclosed rooms without any doors. So these rooms are special because they had to be entered from the top. And we have the same type of structure in area B at site 92 that might actually indicate that it was used for some type of storage. So this is all to say that as far as the administration is concerned, the design of Site 9 is incredibly similar to the Lower Nubian fortresses. Um, the same types of officials likely oversaw similar operations and also organized their spaces according to some sort of like contemporary codified knowledge about how you actually run things in the space that it's in. But now remember there's the defense element. So now let's look at the defense side. And just as a spoiler, the Lower Nubian fortresses are so very cool. They are on par with medieval castles as far as their complexity and their defense design. But that's really a lecture for another day. Check them out because they're awesome. Um, so the Lower Nubian forts are strategically placed to protect Egyptian interests against local Nubians and other people in the area. And there were tons of small villages and small groups of people in Lower Nubia. Uh, who were continue who they were continuously interacting with. Plus, there were people sailing up and down the Nile River, um, and the Egyptians also wanted to control all of the boat traffic. So you can imagine they're interested in this area. And further south of that, you also have the major kingdom of Kerma. The kingdom uh, Kerma, excuse me, was a very powerful kingdom. Um, and they were getting stronger by the day. So they actually did pose a substantial threat of people who could attack Egypt if they wanted to, right? Um, so there were people that they needed to be weary of. But at Site 9, we don't have those same types of people of the same numbers in the East, Eastern Desert. At best, you have some local pastoral nomads um, who might appear as like these extended family groups and maybe on some days they can combine their efforts together and grow into a larger group of raiders but really like they are infrequent and they're probably like groups of 20 at a time that is to say in the eastern desert at wadi el Hudi, there is not really the population threat that is present uh, in lower nubia that you see there so looking at the architectural elements Site 9 does have five to seven possible bastions on its corners, 
Um, and the lower Nubian forts did have similar bastions or parts that basically jut out in front of the wall lines. And people could stand on them and they could give them an excellent vantage point so they could see both inside and outside. If they wanted to, they could probably shoot arrows at those inside or outside. Um, but they could also definitively see along the exterior wall line. That was actually pretty important. So that element is similar. Um, and in some of the bastions of the lower Nubian forts, um, they also have these very amazing arrow slits uh, in the lower Nubian forts. And they flare out into three different directions. So an archer could stand behind them protected and actually shoot arrows in three different ways. Now at site nine and uh, at two places in site five, there are these purposely built holes through the walls. And they are very skinny um, and they're about a meter long shaft uh, and they have these little rocks that like jut up into them but technically you can see from one side to the other um, and people have thought oh these have to be you know arrow loops like in the lower Nubian forts but really they are absolutely ineffective for shooting an arrow through they just they don't flare open so at best, you have about a 10 degree, maybe slightly more than that range if you really wanted to hit a target. And you're also trying to avoid the rocks and you have to kneel down to use them. Honestly, they're, they're only about a meter off the ground. So in many ways, it'd be much more effective for an able-bodied archer to like put his foot in it and then shoot over the wall <laughs> than it would be to actually try to shoot through these things. They, they are very impractical to be used as, um, as a defense mechanism in many ways. Um, okay, so next, that brings me to our walls. Our walls are only about two meters high and that was their original height. So any able-bodied young man could hop over this wall if needed, especially because it has these holes in it that you could use as footholds to step halfway up. But the fortresses in Lower Nubia their walls are 14 meters high, 45 feet tall. So you need a massive ladder to get over it. So these aspects of the wall height are not comparable at all. Plus, if you look at the gates, the lower Nubian fortresses are extremely well designed to close people in them. You bottleneck people inside of them and then you drop things above from above onto them so that they can't get in. But at Wadi El Houdi, our entrances are just open. You know, they never had a means of any gate on them um, or any physical way to close it. So you couldn't actually, you know, keep people out. Uh, additionally, there was one reconstruction made of uh, Site 9's East Gate in 2008, showing how it might actually protect from an oncoming army. But this is also totally impractical reconstruction because Directly on the other side of the ace gate is the giant mine. It's a huge hit, which means that if an army is coming, this is the last direction that they would actually attack from. Um, so in short, when you're looking at military aspects, the, uh, the Egyptians who built Site 9 never actually expected an attack. And the building is not really created to withstand or defend from one in the slightest. So, if the buildings weren't defensible fortresses to keep people out, perhaps they were designed to keep people in. So the next question that you often get um, is, are these buildings prisons or possibly labor camps, right? And to examine this possibility, it assumes that a lot of people doing the grunt labor did not choose to be there and would sometimes probably want to escape. So let's step back and look at the larger aspects of ancient Egyptian society for a minute. Was there a situation where the Egyptians did this type of thing? Did they have labor camps? And the short answer is yes. Um, and it did happen in a few different forms, okay? So, so you have to sort out the different types of forms. First, a standard part of a person's normal taxes to pay to the Egyptian state was paid in conscripted labor. They were required to go work for a couple of weeks or a month on a building project as a tax. And then they were actually, they would go home. This is in fact how the pyramids of Egypt were built with conscripted 
taxed labor on the Egyptian population. But, you know, the Egyptians also did have slaves. Um, these were very often prisoners of war uh, or people who were down on their luck or people gifted to the state as tribute, um, especially during the New Kingdom when they were uh, an empire, but also some during earlier periods too. Um, and the difference here is that a slave is not allowed to quit their jobs. Um, a slave is not allowed to leave um, after a certain period of time. So they would work fully for an institution or for an individual. Now, the Egyptians also did have labor camps for prisoners sometimes. And these prisoners would serve um, a couple of years, basically a longer term than the conscripted labor, uh, but then they would be released. So there are these three groups of non-voluntary labor in Egypt, but there's also voluntary labor too. So the last option is that the people of Wadi El Houdi were properly paid uh, in excess to what they needed to actually survive and eat. Um, they were relatively well treated and they were there voluntarily. So they could quit whenever they didn't wanna work anymore. Um, so let's look at what the inscriptions actually tell us about these points. So let's go back to WH6. I talked about this last chat um, and uh, it lists the laborers who were actually part of these types of expeditions. Um, it also tells us how they get the laborers from various types of town. Um, and it's, it's actually very normal for the Egyptians to gather their labor forces based on geography. So here we know that there were a thousand strong young recruits from various towns in Southern Egypt. Um, in this case, it seems like they're temporary conscription, possibly to pay taxes, or that they're possibly being hired voluntarily to be part of this campaign. So that's one side to voluntary labor. Um, also looking at WH4, which is also very early from the, uh, from the Middle Kingdom, it shows us that um, people from parts of Nubia were brought to help. Now, we're not gonna go into detail about this today, um, but there are loads of reasons to know that Egyptians and Nubians and multicultural laborers actually work together at Wadi El Houdi. Uh, and in this case, an official by the name of Intef wrote this inscription. And here he claims that the Nubians came there with their stuff um, and that they came only for the love of the possessor of right. So uh, Intef is extolling himself here, right? He's basically, they came because they like Intef because he's a just leader. So we can trust Intef's inscription verbatim and say, oh, okay, these guys are here by choice. Or of course we can read it with an eye of sarcasm if we want to and say, ah, oh, ha ha, that's just what Intef would say that we don't actually know. So again, you can interpret it both ways. Now on the opposite side of that, you have WH-143, forest inscription from um, the reign of Sinwazir I. Um, now, remember, Sinwazir I was the king who was the first person to annex, annex parts of Nubia during this major political shift that was anti-Nubian in many ways. Um, and he says in this particular inscription, as for any Nubian of Nubia, um, his work as a slave is only done because of the terror inspired by this great God or this God. Of course, he's referring to himself, Sinwazir the first as the God. Um, so here he's painting the workers clearly as slaves and he uses the word for slaves. But you can also read this literarily too. So if Sinwazir the first just wants to claim that they're there as the slaves, you know, it adds into his whole idea of this new political shift and divine kingship. I mean, in Egypt, even the vizier, the number two guy in the entire country calls themselves a slave to the king on occasion. So we don't know. I mean, maybe he's just saying everybody's a slave. Again, you can read it both ways. So in short, the texts leave us with ambiguous evidence um, that can be interpreted both ways. Uh, either towards voluntary or involuntary labor based on what you want to read into it. Um, and so we need to look at the archaeology for more evidence. And as we look at the archaeology, we need to look at elements that might indicate if the laborers are there voluntarily or involuntary. Were the laborers treated well? Were the laborers treated poorly? Those types of questions. 
Now, as we talked about last time, the laborers were provided food and water, um, and the excavations demonstrate that they also ate a lot of meat at Wadi Yohudi, including sheep, goat, gazelle, salted fish brought from the Nile. Protein, of course, is needed for people doing manual labor. So that was very nice of them uh, to provide them the food they needed. Um, also, in parts of the mining process, like cutting the stone, or even reducing access of bedrock away from the raw amethyst, it took a level of care. It took a level of skill. So people had to do it the right way, or else they'd accidentally smash the amethyst. Um, and so this, uh, so if people were doing this involuntarily, it would be very, very easy for them to sabotage the pur purpose of the mission, right? They could just stand there and accidentally hit all the amethyst, um, saying, oh, oops, I broke it again. Um, <laughs> and this would lead to a level of frustration. But when we look at the mining debris, it looks like the workers were actually doing a fairly good job. Um, they weren't purposely sabotaging what they were out there to do. So additionally, looking at the walls of both site five and site nine that are at best two meters high, they, could actually con um, they couldn't actually confine any able-bodied man who could hop over them and sneak off into the desert. Um, and we know that they, worked all over the landscape too. They didn't just stay inside these buildings. Um, and we know this particularly from site four that shows loads of activities happening all over the hillsides and elsewhere. Plus Wadi El Houdi is only 35 kilometers from Aswan. And there's a well-marked path that I talked about last time leading back to the Nile. Um, so if someone wanted to just escape, it would only be a walk of a day or two to be able to get back to a city. And that is will go with doable, even when you have few resources. It's not impossible. But the one thing that we do have lots and lots of evidence for at Wadi Hilhudi is a substantial presence of soldiers or guards. Um, essentially, there are continuous numbers of eyes watching people there. And you start to question, are these soldiers protecting the workers from those on the outside or are they watching the workers doing the things that they do on the inside? Like what, were, what was the mission of all of these people actually there? And this is also talked about in WH6, um, the, that particular inscription. It says that they brought 200 soldiers from Elephantine and another 100 soldiers from Komodo. So that's 300 soldiers for a team of 1,500 people. That's a lot. So that means that one out of five people were a soldier. And if you take out the administrators, that would mean that there was one soldier for every 3.3 workmen. That is a very, very hefty police presence, especially considering the cost of feeding these people out there in the desert. Why, why so many, right? Now at site nine, we already mentioned the bastions that the guards could stand on and they could see everything that happened inside and outside of the building. But we have similar types of things at site five. There are several clear boulders that were marked as stations for soldiers where guards would sit for hours in various shifts. And these stations um, were, these stations particularly occur uh, overlooking entrances, overlooking exits, where you have vast views of the landscape in multiple directions, uh, and they protected these administrative areas. And then, of course, there is Site 6. I haven't talked about Site 6 yet. Site 6 is really cool, too. Um, site 6 is a soldier's lookout from the very tippy top of a mountain. And from this vantage point, you can see everything. You can see site nine, site five, basically the whole way to site four. You can see the road to Aswan. And you can see all of these connecting, uh, interlinking paths through the landscape from this particular vantage point. Now at this site, um, this site must have been continuously staffed by soldiers. And we know this because in all of their hours and hours of boredom, right, these soldiers individually kept inscriptions of themselves all over the rocks. So about 100 of our inscriptions just come from Site 6 alone. 
and they mark an entire soldiering class of people. They're really cool. Some of them show some soldiers were literate and they wrote their names and titles uh, while uh, some were not with just their strong image and weapons, possibly even some more. Um, we also know from these inscriptions that the soldiers worked with dogs at Wadi Al Hudi to help them get their job done. So as you know, dogs are, are very great for alerting anyone of oncoming people, of uh, chasing things that move in the desert, whether it's people or gazelle or other types of animals. Um, and they were definitely an active presence there as well. Um, and regardless if these workers were there voluntarily or involuntarily, they were protected and watched by copious numbers of guards, basically around the clock. So at Wadi Al Hudi, we're still on the fence about whether or not the workers actually wanted to be there, right? And we're looking for more evidence. But in addition to the forts or the labor camps, there's one more possibility to consider when we try to answer what these buildings were used for. So consider this, what if it's not about the people? What if it's about protecting the stuff, right? Maybe it's the stuff. So as we talked about last time, supplying Wadi Al Hudi was a very complex activity. Food and especially water needed to be imported from very far away, possibly even as far as the Nile. Water was definitely the most precious commodity in the desert. Um, and as we talked about last time, amethyst was also exceedingly valuable and rare um, and totally controlled by Pharaoh. And it was the job of some 200 administrators. So nearly one out of six people to ensure the safe acquisition, transit, rationing, and storage of these goods. That is no small task at all. So when we look at the archeology, span uh, so what does the archeology span show us? We know from the ceramic distributions at sites four and five that the administration definitely rationed water. Um, they controlled and protected every drop. And at site four, this is on a hillside where people might have like lined up and to walk over and collect their water rations. At site five, it's in within this very highly restricted administrative zone um, that protected that was protected by these incredibly unique inner enclosure walls and like several guard posts over them. And we also talked last time about how Site 9 also provides lots of evidence for the purposeful watching over and refinement of the amethyst in different in three different locations too. Um, and the last and most protected level of refinement had people carrying all of the amethyst to the top of the hill uh, at Site 5 into this very protective and guarded courtyard to refine it there. Um, so site nine shows us similar things too. So area A has the highest and thickest walls within the entire building. It also has the protective path around the exterior wall so that people can't just like easily hop into area A from the outside, um, that this path prevents them from doing it. Um, and Basically, it is also a very weird maze of rooms to get be able to get into these back storage areas parts. It was purposely designed to restrict the number of people that could get in. Um, and so even, so our eyes are then drawn to this one central room in the very back. This room was built first. We can tell that because all the other walls like lean into it. Um, it also has substantially thicker walls than everywhere else at site nine too. Um, and it is very difficult to get into. It's protected in many ways. And somebody took the time and effort to put tons of little teeny tiny stones in between all of the big rocks. This is not normal for the rest of our walls. It's just big rocks stop, uh, stacked on top of one another. But here you have these tiny, tiny little stones to, you know, I don't know, block the person's view. Um, this was very, this was a very purposeful action and it only occurs in this room. So whatever was kept in this room must have been highly protected and its contents must have been incredibly value, valuable. So perhaps would it be possible that 
those 300 soldiers were there to protect the stuff primarily and then the people secondarily? I don't know. It's a possibility. So what is the purpose of these buildings at sites four, five, and nine? We don't have a definitive answer yet. <laughs> and every time we have a new archaeological season, we find new evidence and create new uh, arguments every time out. So I basically laid out the sides of the debate on all sides, and I showed you all the evidence. And today, I want to do something a little different. I want to ask you what you think about all of this. So we're going to vote on it. Um, I actually created this uh, poll within, um, with, uh, sorry, one second. Ah, okay. I created a poll within Zoom, and we are going to address, oh, my computer seems to have frozen for a sec. Okay, I got this. Ah, there we go. Okay, sorry. Um, so I created a poll within um, Zoom, and I want you guys to try to answer these two questions that should have just popped up onto your screen now. Um, so the first question is, is what was the purpose of the buildings at Wadi El Hudi? You can answer, you know, are they a fortress? Are they protective storage vaults? Are they prisons? Do you think it's complicated and you don't really know? Also, who were the laborers at Wadi El Hudi? Were they well-treated volunteers, employees that were there on their own regards? Were they well-treated conscripted laborers who were paying their taxes but could actually go home at the end of the day? Uh, were they poorly treated conscripted laborers that didn't want to be there and you know would you know would unhappily um, not like being there? Or were they prisoners and slaves who were forced to be there? So I'll give you just a minute to think about that. Um, but it, it is amazing as to how archaeology, you know, you always have to be looking at every element of the archaeology um, daily to see these types of things. You know, each piece of evidence can change your interpretation as well. Um, so it's very interesting. And I see loads of people logging in now. So I'm going to keep this open longer. That's great. Then is there a question you might want me to answer uh, in the interim while we let people do the poll? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, Kate, as we were going, you were answering all the questions. <laughs> that, was, that was fantastic. Um, a question about just sort of the environmental conditions and things. Uh, a question from Gwyneth that I thought was interesting. Would the water or the amethyst need more protection? Thinking about protecting the water might include having less air to get to it and thus the plugging up of the holes and having thicker walls. Water or amethyst, Kate? Would oh. You're the making, you're just, so you're deciding between the two most precious commodities. Uh, well, I mean, like, obviously, it's it's not either or. It has to be both. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I think that the 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 thicker, thicker rooms of protection were probably for the amethyst. Um, but the water was still not treated lightly, although it's physically larger. And you also have donkey trains coming in, um, probably with water and animal skins and pouring them into the larger jars. So you need larger spaces for those jars to be set up. Um, although I haven't quite found exactly where that is yet, although we have found some places where water and placements were around. Um, so the tiny room is probably the amethyst, but the larger protected room is probably the water. Um, okay. So with that being said, I'm going to end the poll because the numbers of people participating have slowed down and hopefully I can share all of this with you guys. Do you actually, do you actually see the results? Um, okay, so the first question is, what was the purpose of the buildings at, um, at Wadi El Hudi? And a lot of people think it's a protective storage vault or they say it's complicated, maybe a bit of each. Wow. Um, that is great. I, I, I did my job. I convinced you. Yay. <laughs> That's kind of where we're leaning right now, too. Um, but, you know, it is it is a bit complicated and we, we might have uh, different questions and other points as well. OK, so the second question, who were the laborers at Wadi Ohudi? 
Okay, so a lot of you guys, the winning one was well-treated conscripted laborers there to pay their taxes. Very good, that is over 62%. Um, I do think that that is a big possibility. Um, the other issue is that the laborers, okay, so we have these temporary ex expeditions, right? Every expedition needs a different set of laborers. So I do think that conscripted laborers were doing a bulk of this. So good job, that's awesome. Um, uh, but it is possible that individual, individual trips out of the desert might have tried different types of things too. Um, but this is great, that's very informative. Uh, so that is exactly where I'm at now too. So um, yay. Um, anyway, so you know, thank you guys so much for participating in this. Um, and I just wanted to thank you all for coming to the talk today, learning about Wadi El Hoodie. If you want to learn more, check out wadielhoodie.com or we're on Facebook, um, you know, send me an email. And I wanted to thank absolutely everybody who's ever helped us, uh, both in Egypt and around the world. We have just worked with a tremendous team of of uh, volunteers and supporters and, and friends of our project. So I wanted to thank everybody. So thank you and thanks for having me here today. And I'm happy to ask, answer more questions if there are any. Okay, so I'm gonna stop you, my you share. Know, you know there are gonna be questions, Kate. <laughs> Just a few, right? <laughs> yeah, and it, it's sort of a mix, right? So we can, uh, let, me, let, me, let me start with the kind of the questions about the project itself. Um, and about you. So Kate, how did, how, why Egypt? Why mining? Why amethyst? Why work out in the desert when you could be in Cairo, in a hotel? What, how did you get into this? Ah, great question. Uh, I was one of those eight-year-olds where Egypt was always the answer. Um, <laughs> and then I just kind of never stopped. So it's kind of weird. I'm still on plan A for life. It's, it's, that doesn't usually happen. <laughs> uh, as far as the desert goes, um, Wadi El Hudi has a mix of really cool academic questions that come together that I, I, I and my team particularly are interested in. Um, I was drawn to this space um, because I wrote my dissertation on pastoral nomads from the Eastern desert and how they become Nubians and laborers in, in before. Um, and I also am very interested in administration and urbanism. Um, and I also wanted a, an archeological project that was logistically easy. So even though we are out in the Eastern desert, we actually stay in Aswan in nice apartments and you know have hot showers most days. Oh, uh, and so it's it's all good. Um, but I guess that's why that particular space. But it's it's a very cool place that um, questions can be answered there that can't be answered at most other archaeological sites because it's essentially a time capsule in the desert that most people haven't have never visited or gotten to see. Uh, and then, uh, well. What is the field season? How long are you in the field? What does the field season look like for you? When do you go to? Great question. Um, short answer is we go anytime that the permissions line up with the funding and line up with the schedule. So field seasons often change time um, and they are often confined more by funding and schedule than a lot of other things. Um, so we've, we've gone almost any time. Uh, we try not to go in the summer, um, but we've been there from you know, usually four to 10 weeks is usually about the length of time, um, maybe a little longer, um, but um, yeah, we've gone between October and March, usually whenever things line up. Yeah. What does Wadi El Hudi mean? We don't know. Um, <laughs> well, a Wadi is a desert, right? But a Hudi is weird. Um, and Brian Kramer, our co-director, has been trying to figure this out forever. It is just a name that Egyptians don't even know what it means. They all think it has a second age, Yahudi, but it's actually the first age, Yahudi. And so it's really, we don't know. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, a question about your team, the composition of your team. Is it a mix of uh, students, Egyptian professionals, volunteers? How does that work? 
it is a mix of a lot of different people who are interested. Um, so we we definitely work with um, lots of people from Egypt. Uh, we're always looking for um, specialists as well who have different specializations about different aspects of things. So like, uh, so last time we were lucky, we were able to bring in somebody to just look at our charcoal or somebody to look at our botanicals um, or bring in a conservator to help us with stele um, or um, but we also do give opportunities to uh, archaeological students who are going to go on in the field or people who know uh, GIS, Ge uh, Geographic Information Systems, that's used for mapping. Um, and so we, we find basically anybody that has a different um, skill that can help the project. But it is unbelievable the range of skills that are needed. Um, very scientific things bring into account. Um, so we're looking for more like geological students that can help us to understand the natural area. So, um, but we, we have a team of people from all around the world um, that, that come together to help. So. Okay, let's, so now questions on um, the things that people were asking about. So, and we had this question last time you spoke about this as well, Kate. People are curious about was the environment that you're in similar to what it would have been back in the day? Mostly, yes. Yeah. Uh, we're just going to go with mostly yes. There might have been a minor shift and change, or maybe there were a couple more plants, but it certainly wouldn't have been super nice. Um, well, you know, it wouldn't have had a lot. There wouldn't have been like wells of water that we can't see today, right? There wouldn't have been large amounts of plants besides a couple of random plants in the wadi. Um, so we're going to go with mostly. And scams are men only? I think they are men only. Um, we have been looking for women and children. We're not adverse to that. Um, pretty sure it's just men. So the living conditions, are these sort of like, are you in dormitory style buildings? Are they tents? How are these men living out in these buildings, in these areas? Yeah, uh, we don't, that is a big question, right? Uh, we do have some little like types of hut structures um, where when they're excavated, they are, you know, maybe three meters by five meters. So, so something like 10 feet to 15 feet, you could probably sleep a couple of people in those, uh, two or three. And then they do show some like food preparation areas and some burning areas outside of them. So it does seem like we were kind of living in those spaces. Um, the walls are only about 70 centimeters to so maybe a meter high. So on top of the walls, um, there probably would have been some sort of shading mechanisms made with some sort of plants. We have been looking for the plants a lot and we have not found them. <laughs> um, okay. That isn't because they weren't there, but it's an area where any plants in the desert could easily have been burnt by later people because everybody needs fuel in the desert or uh, they could have blown away over a, a large amount of time. Um, we do know that they were using a lot of desert plants for fuel and for burning things. Um, and also then probably also dung of animals too. But we're still looking to pr prove all that. That being said, when you count up all of the number of spaces that people could sleep in, in these various areas, it might house like two or 300. It doesn't house 1,500. So I still don't know where you put 1,500 people. Um, and we look for like tent areas. Uh, we do know like what a tent area looks like. They kind of clear a space and get rid of areas for rocks and the large rocks around them. Uh, and around sites five and nine, they are, are not like copious large areas. Um, for big tension placements. So there's some near site four, but those also might be Roman or later. Um, so it's it's still it's still a, a nagging question. So there are a lot of questions about the walls, by the way. Um, I like why are they only that height? Uh, why aren't they, you know, why that height, I guess, starting with that. Yeah, okay, so two meters um, and probably tall enough to you know just not see over it's like why do you always build your fence with your wall at six feet right so you just cannot see your neighbor <laughs> uh but then you know also it's, it's just right under the height of a person so if you wanted to have like some sort of shading mechanism it could go over the top however most of the smaller walls are only about a meter to 70 centimeters so at that point you still would have had to have some sort of angled space in them so i'm not I'm still not quite sure exactly how that would have worked in some of the smaller walls. Um, and we're looking for parallels and other types of things too. Um, but I think that the height of the walls is essentially because it didn't need to be higher than that. 
they wasn't a second floor. There wasn't a, a roof space that they worked on like we have in a lot of other places. We don't have any staircases to go up to a second floor area. Um, yeah. There are a couple in site five, but that's because it's a hillside, you know, so that's not to get to a second floor. And the, the, the walls themselves, so all dry laid, no mortar, and is there any sort of finishing on them or is it just that's it what you see is pretty much how it would look like in the past what you see is what you get um they would have picked up the stones directly from the surface uh, so you have the dark brown stones that were, were the surface stones but you also have this lighter pinkish stone that is uh the granitoid bedrock that came out of the mine as debris so you basically they'd pick up the large stones and stack the walls uh they are about a meter wide at their base and then as they go up they taper up on both sides uh, to be usually about a half meter, maybe slightly less at the top so that it actually preserves the stability of it. Um, so they, they're like these little triangles going up. Okay, uh, interesting. Uh, and someone asked if the slits in the wall, that if they were not being used by archers, could they be for drainage? Not for drainage uh, because the water wouldn't have actually like gotten to them. Although the thing that I didn't talk about is that these holes in the walls are also found in Nubian settlements too. Uh, there's a bunch at Wadi um, uh, and in that was a, a Nubian settlement that was contemporary at the time. And in a different article that I wrote, uh, I kind of argued that Nubians were part of their workforce and that they built these walls, but they would have been basically like windows going through them um, or you know, spaces to kind of see out of, you know, maybe pass your coffee through the window. No, that's a joke. They didn't have coffee. Anymore. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> what were they drinking other than water? Uh, well, well, the na normal things to drink in ancient Egypt were water and beer. Um, beer provided a lot of caloric substance. It was much more like um, uh, much more like porridge uh, type of thing. Um, and it had a, a low alcohol content too. So it would be very filling. Um, that being said, I don't, we're still looking for beer in the desert. Like they would have, they, they should have drunk it, but then they would have had to carry it from the whole way from the Nile. So I'm, I'm not really positive what's happening there yet. Okay. Now, uh, uh, questions about sort of the general living conditions, the people out there. One of the things that I thought was interesting were people asking the questions about the art the, uh, that you showed on the rocks. So the archers and the dogs, who is, who is, who is producing the graffiti? Ah, great question. There are three types of um, inscriptions. One, there are the large historic inscriptions that the uh, officials and administrators you know, wrote or commissioned that were done by professional scribes or at least scribes that were good enough. A lot of them are written in a uh, slight cursive um, as opposed to proper hieroglyphs, which is normal for, for scribes, but it isn't like, like temple art type of thing. Um, so, but those larger inscriptions were done officially. They're meant to be an official record and last forever. The second type are the other ones that I showed you are the police graffiti, right? They're, all these people are sitting around on their, um, on their outposts for hours on end. And then they, you know, it's like, well, I'll just draw myself and my dog today. Um, but then there's a third type too. Within individual houses and individual spaces, you often get uh, just people's names and their titles mm -hmm. or like who they, who they were connected to. And those are really cool because it seems like, like a small individual room belong to that person for at least a month or two, right? Like that person can be connected to that space architecturally. Um, also of note, the first type, the historic inscriptions by the administrators, those are very always put on areas of high traffic with high visibility. They're basically like billboards, you know, like, so you put them on the path where you walk to the road to that swan or you put them out on the on the side of the hill that people can see as they go by. They were, they were meant to be seen. But these other ones, the inscriptions of the soldiers and the inscriptions of the individual people, those didn't have the same type of audience. So they would be where people spent time. Okay. Uh, and then the, the, these, these guys were out there in the desert, a question sort of about their living conditions, the social conditions, you know, they, do we get any evidence for kind of the, the mental condition of these folks who are out there, you know, being working here, uh, you know, they're sort of there, what are they doing for entertainment? You know, those kinds of questions, like how are these folks, what is their life like out there in the, in the, in, in these settlements? 
Okay, well, a lot of that is speculation um, because yep. in some ways we can't know. Um, I'm assuming that a lot of their time was just spent working and sleeping and resting. Um, but for fun, we do have a couple of indications. There is one stele that shows a weird wrestling scene um, between, between a soldier and um, somebody from uh, the, the Levant, he's called an Amu, which is the, the word for the people of, of the, you know, the Levant or the Eastern desert in the North. So he seems like a foreigner in some capacity, but then again, it could also be a name, it's weird. But anyways, so we have an inscription of a weird wrestling scene. So maybe like soldiers, you know, wrestled in their spare time or at least one person did it once. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, we also have these very strange piles of rocks next to site five that I initially thought, or we initially thought marked tombs, but they don't, they don't mark tombs. They, uh, a couple of them mark paths and roads, um, but a lot of them are just piles of rocks in the desert. So I, I don't know, sometimes I joke about them having rock piling contests, <laughs> but that's total <laughs> speculation. <laughs> I can't actually say that. These, these piles of rocks are still a giant mystery to us. Um, we know that they're not tombs, we know that only a couple are um, marked mark paths and sight lines. And so it's like, well, what about the other 90%? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I really, I really don't know. And do we know what their work a day is like? Is it, is it, are they doing it in shifts and working these mines constantly? Or is it sort of your work day that is sort of daylight to sunset? And Okay, so that type of question has to be answered from usually textual data where they actually tell us when they're working and how they're working. Or, and so like, I, I can answer that question for other places where work was done. So like when they were, you know, digging the unfinished obelisk, which is in Aswan, we know that people would work until they completed a quota each day or each month, and then they could, then they could go. Um, or if you look at texts from Daryl Medina, when these people are building the tombs of the Pharaoh, um, we know there that, that uh, they would work in sometimes in shifts where they would, you know, especially during the summer hours, they would work early morning, then they would have like a super long siesta, then they would work in the evening. Um, when it was winter, they, they could sometimes do morning and afternoon and then stop in the evening. Um, but all of that type of information is going to be preserved from other types of sites. So I don't actually know how those rules change when you are confined in a desert space because the right. other two places are where they had their homes where they had their wives and their kids and their friends and definitely their fun events right out in the desert i i i don't know i mean you could imagine oh around the clock you can imagine shift type of things um the temperature was probably an aspect but um i mean i i, yeah. I I'm just guessing. Okay, last question, because we kind of have to wrap up pretty soon, but Kate, so since this is an archaeology talk, let's come back to the archaeology. You've talked about the features, the buildings, but what are some of the artifacts that you've found that have been kind of memorable? Your top five artifacts. Top five artifacts. Oh, well, we found loads of stele. They're so yeah. cool. We probably found about 10 or 15 stele that are just like They'll change history, uh, or once we, you know, um, get them underway. Uh, finding the sites is always fun too. You know, being the first person in a new space. Um, but if we're actually talking about like digging, um, we have found some very cool things, especially from the the Greco-Roman excavations in uh, Site Four. Because Site Four, we have two major time periods. We have the uh, Middle Kingdom, so something like 2000 BC, and then we have the Greek and Roman period. Um, uh, you know, around the year zero type of thing. Uh, we found, you know, over some 60 ostraca. Ostraca are very cool because they are broken pottery shirts with writing on them. Um, and the writing tells us, you know, like what, who they were talking to. There's a lot of letters. There's a lot of accounts talking about like how the mining process was done. Um, and so that will give us loads of information for the Greek and Roman time. Um, we've also found, this is more tantalizing than not, but we found a couple of seal impressions and um, mm. one seal and one scarab thing. Um, and uh, they, they're, they're teasing me more than anything because, you know, they got a couple of names and titles on them, but it's still not the level of information that, that I... I really need to reconstruct. So so if you are, uh, if you're an Egyptologist, you know that if you have, okay, so let me step back. Officials, when they would close something, 
um, or end something, whether it was a door, whether it was a, a jar that was being locked, they would put a piece of mud on it and they would stamp it. And sometimes they would stamp it with their name and title, or sometimes they would just stamp it with their symbol that indicated them, even if their name and title wasn't on it. So a lot of people have like used these broken pieces of mud with these stamps on it to reconstruct full administrative practices. And we are really trying to do that. Um, we're at about six to 10 right now. Uh, and one is actually an institutional field, uh, which means that they're talking to a major institution or maybe they're, they are an institution, but of course the name is broken. So I just feel like this, this site is teasing me in some way. I know it's there. I just need more time. Right. <laughs> Go get it. <laughs> yeah. So. Kate, thank you so much. Thank That's you. Cool. I also want to thank Amber and Iris for helping us with the interpretation. Um, and thank you to everybody who tuned in to, to uh, listen to Kate. Uh, keep, uh, you know, follow, uh, go to our website. We have other Archaeology of Bridge Talks coming up. Um, we have uh, one on April, uh, sorry, March 10th, and then a couple in April. So there'll be a full list on the website. Um, where you can, and, and, and of course, we'll send out the emails. But Kate, thank you. Yeah, thanks all for coming today. It was a real pleasure to be able to share this with the AIA audience.